introduction to everyone on this chat now, on this conference now. Um, Merlin Crosley is a Deputy Vice Chancellor at the University of New South Wales. Um, Merlin's got a long history of research into the globe and genes, and he's a world expert in this field. And we're really lucky to have him talking today. So I'm really looking forward to this talk. So look, it's absolutely fantastic to be here. Uh, this conference is making a huge difference. I want to thank Agnes, uh, Marguerite, Nicole, uh, it was terrific to see the minister, Greg Hunt, is aware of this. The government is aware of what they call rare diseases, but sickle cell is uh, the, the most abundant, most prevalent uh, single gene defect, I believe. And it was great to see Mark Butler today. And Zhao, it's lovely to see uh, you again at uh, this conference. So I'm just going to talk for 20 minutes and to just give you try to convey the fact that we have excellent research happening here in Australia. We're connected to the community and the study of sickle cell has been a major study in the evolution of molecular biology and the understanding of human genetics. And my lab's in Sydney at University of New South Wales. Next slide, please. Yeah. So our whole concept, I'm a scientist. I'm not a clinical researcher. I just saw David Hughes talk, which was fascinating about the treatments, but I'm a scientist and we believe that if we can understand a disease, understand the molecular basis, the chemical basis, that might help us to develop a cure, but it's going to take time. And, uh, you know, I wish it didn't take so long. I started working on Globins in 1990, so that's 30 years or so ago, uh, but a lot's been achieved and a lot more will be achieved in the next 30 years. Next slide. So the background of when people started looking at this, James Herrick in Chicago, there was a young medical student who uh, had the symptoms of sickle cell. He just said, let's look at the blood under the microscope. They looked at the blood, they saw these cells which were misshapen and those cells get blocked in capillaries and cause pain. Linus Pauling said there's something wrong with the blood cells. He looked at the protein, hemoglobin, ran it on a gel. You would have seen gels where you can separate proteins. And he said, saw that it migrated at a different rate. He said, this is the world's first molecular disease understood at a chemical level. And then less than 10 years later, Vernon Ingram, used protein sequencing to identify the exact mutation. Proteins are made up of amino acids and uh, a glutamate, uh, a negatively charged amino acid is replaced with a valine at position seven. And that means that the hemoglobin proteins stick together and the shape becomes, uh, the, pro the cells become an odd shape. In 1960, Max Perutz and John Kendrew used X-ray crystallography to solve the structure. They won a Nobel Prize for that. I mean, Linus Pauling also won a Nobel Prize earlier. And then Fred Sanger, another Nobel Prize winner, uh, his sequencing method was used to find the actual mutation, which we think occurred uh, once many thousands of years ago. Uh, so it really, globins could be, hemoglobin and its history could be used to explain the whole evolution of molecular biology. Next slide, please, yeah. So we found out so much, but you'll be thinking, does this suggest a cure? And we kept working, we kept working. There was no light at the end of the tunnel for a while, although that was interesting. Next slide. But Janet Watson, who worked in America, she was a pediatrician. She made an interesting clinical observation that children had much milder disease than adults. And she knew that human has, humans have several different globin genes. Uh, when we're very young in utero, we have a special fetal globin gene with a high affinity to oxygen, draws the oxygen from the mother's blood. And uh, as we're born, that gene is gradually turned off and the adult globin gene comes on. That's the one with the mutation we've just talked about. So you develop the condition as your adult globin gene comes on. And she realized that children have their fetal globin on a little bit, and that stops the disease. So people started thinking, if only we could turn that fetal globin gene on in everyone with sickle cell, would that cure the disease? And this was a new idea. Next slide, Chow. And 
this idea, so it's at a completely new research direction. And back in 1978, George and Thalia Stamatoinopoulos, who worked in Seattle in America, set up a biannual conference. So every two years, researchers from, out, from across the world would gather, and Zhao's been to this conference, and I've been to this conference almost every time uh, since about 1990, and uh, say, saying, if we can understand how fetal globin genes are turned on and off, perhaps we can artificially turn them on. Next slide. So this is called the Hemoglobin Switching Conference. It's an extremely famous conference. There's about 200 scientists go, I don't know, they would be from uh, 50, 60 labs around the world. And the meetings are either held in Oxford or in a sim similar. You may have heard of Asilomar. That was where the first genetic engineering conference where they talked about uh, having a moratorium was uh, held uh, way back in the 70s. People from Australia who go, Andrew Perkins from Monash goes each year, Stephen Jane, or oh, every second year it is, uh, Stephen Jane from Monash, uh, Jim Vidalis, who Xiao's done lots of work with, and my lab goes every second year. And that's just a photo of us in Oxford gathered underneath uh, a castle. And it just gives you the idea that these people are working across the world on this problem and have been since 1978. Next slide. So we believe that turning on the fetal globin genes will be a future cure. Hydroxyurea, one of the drugs, that somehow turns on the fetal globin genes and that's used as a treatment. And we think if we can find, uh, if we can work out, we don't know how hydroxyurea works, but if we can work out artificial ways of turning on the fetal glo globin genes, that could be a cure. Why are we so sure? Next slide, Xiao. Because there are families, and you'll recognize this is just a list of pedigrees. There are families in the world who have natural beneficial mutations that turn on their fetal globin gene. They have hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin. And if they have the sickle cell defect, they don't have severe treatments. And these patients are absolutely fine. So we're talking about mimicking. This is a, a natural miracle. If we could mimic this natural miracle, we could uh, treat this disease. Next slide. When you map those mutations in the different families, so going from left to right, you can see that uh, each arrow is a different mutation in a different family. They fall into two clusters. And so we're saying we know that these mutations somehow cause the fetal globin gene to be highly expressed. And we asked in our lab, and, and many people have asked this question, how do these mutations cause the fetal globin gene to be highly expressed? Many of you will be used to looking at genes. The black part's the gene that gets read into messenger RNA and protein. And the part on the left, uh, that's the called the promoter. That's the control sequence upstream. And if you inherit a mutation in that sequence, the gene might be turned on. And what we decided was those two clusters, the one at minus 200 and the one, one at minus 115, were like uh, handbrakes. And if you took the handbrake off, the gene would be turned on. Next slide, please, Sha. So a couple of the people in my lab who started working exactly on those mutations in 2012, so it took us nearly 10 years to do this. Uh, Bika uh, was a student who came from Germany and Gabby was a student who grew up in Sydney and that's the lab at the University of New South Wales in that building. Next slide. So this was a hypothesis that uh, there were two repressor proteins that sat down on the DNA and stopped the uh, fetal globin gene being expressed in adults. And uh, we set out to find out which was the, what's the red protein, what's the blue protein. If we can understand them, we can understand why fetal globin genes turned off and we might be able to turn it back on. Next slide, please. So uh, Gabby started working on the, uh, the right-hand one. That's the blue one, I think. And uh, I said, look, let's just use, let's try all the existing proteins that are known one at a time and see if any of them bind to the minus 115 region. And you can mix radioactive DNA. It's just radioactive, so it's labeled so that you can see it with an X-ray film or equivalent. 
and we'll mix it with some protein that we can make recombinant protein in the lab, see if any of them stick to that particular DNA. And the next slide shows the result. So uh, you can see there uh, a black band uh, with an arrow going to it. That's the protein binding to the DNA, uh, and it, it causes a band to migrate at that particular location. And the protein has this strange name of BCL11A, and we knew from genetic studies that that was the key protein involved in regulating the level of fetal hemoglobin, and there it was binding to the site implicated by the mutations. But did the mutations knock off that binding? Next slide, please, yeah. So here it is again, and you can see it in the second lane on that gel on the left. There's BCL11A binding to the DNA and you get a black band. And then we tested one at a time the mutations from the different families. And when you introduce a mutation from the, one of any of those families who have the fetal globin gene on, you see much less binding. So that was the handbrake. BCL11A sits down on the DNA and stops the fetal globin gene being expressed. And next slide, Xiao. So that was Gabby's uh, contribution there. BC11A binds to that site, and that's one of the breaks that keeps uh, fetal globin gene off. And Beaker worked on the other one. And if, if BC11A doesn't bind, uh, you get about 50% the normal level, the, the maximal level. So we said, well, there's two hand breaks. Let's look at the red one. And Beaker looked at the red one. Again, she tried many different uh, proteins. And she found a protein called ZBTB7A, another long name for technical historical reasons. And the next slide shows that. Thanks, Yao. So uh, ZBTB7A, also known as LRF, uh, there it is binding. You can see again, uh, it binds to the, the sequence. And we said, do the mutations uh, prevent it from binding? And the next slide shows that they do. So there they are. Uh, stopping the, the binding, you get some binding with the mutations, but much less. So families that have these mutations uh, don't have uh, the binding site for this repressor protein. And so the fetal globin gene stays on for their whole life. And that it causes no ill effects, but it compensates and can replace uh, mutated sickle cell adult globin protein. Next slide, Xiao. So there's the promoter, and uh, it's relatively simple. Uh, we've done more work on it, and many people have done work on it. It has, uh, it's like, think of it as a car. It has uh, an accelerator pedal, which is actually in between those two, and it has uh, uh, represses, uh, two brakes pedals, uh, the minus 200 cluster and the minus 115 cluster. So we now know that these repressor proteins directly prevent the gene being expressed in adulthood. And if you stop them getting to the promoter, uh, the gene will come on. So scientists are quite excited about this because now we can study how BC11A and how ZBT7A work, how they are produced, how are they stabilized in the cell, and look for drugs that may prevent their production or activity. And that's explained on the next couple of slides. So, although the first thing is, can we actually replicate? Can we, you might've heard of CRISPR gene editing. Can we go into uh, bone marrow stem cells and replicate the mutations which are in the family? And uh, we can do that and people are doing that type of work. So the next slide is, uh, this is the work Gabby did. She said, let's replicate those mutations around minus 115. And you can just see there's some technical data there, but on those graphs, if you replicate the mutation, you get lots more fetal globin. This is in a cell line, a uh, red blood cell line. And on the right, there's a, a, a graph showing the red, which is the fetal globin coming on. So you can replicate this with CRISPR gene editing. So next slide. So is this a therapy? Can you use CRISPR gene editing to modify stem cells and do somatic gene therapy, uh, putting this mutation in to turn on fetal globin, and uh, that would be ben very beneficial for the protein. And the answer is very simple. Next slide. 
yes, this is being done in, oh, we have to go back <laughs> a bit too far. Uh, yeah, so this is being done in the US and France, uh, but it remains a very complicated treatment. And David Hughes's talk sort of explained this. Uh, uh, he explained that you, he talked about taking a, a stem cell transplant from another, from a donor, what this would involve is, first of all, getting the bone marrow stem cells out. You can mobilize them into the blood. You've got to get them out. Then you've got to modify them with CRISPR. You can do that. Uh, then you have to do this treatment of the patient, uh, the so-called conditioning, which is a, a, quite a, a severe, serious treatment. And then uh, you inject the modified cells back in. And, and, and David Hughes explained that's actually uh, that's an anticlimax. That's actually quite easy. They go into the blood and find their way back into the bone marrow. So this is like a bone marrow transplant, but it's a serious treatment. This isn't going to be done across Africa, India, the subcontinent, but it is being done in the United States and it is being done in France. And uh, there's some very good trials occurring there. And so far the results, I'm, I'm very optimistic about this, although I'm not a clinician, so I'm probably not the best person to judge. Uh, next slide, please, Shao. So is there a better way? Uh, you know, there's this disease, I won't go into it, called TTR, where they've now done gene therapy in patients, where instead of taking the uh, affected cells out, modifying them to fix them and injecting them back in, you inject CRISPR into the patient. People are pretty nervous about this. Ugh, why would you inject CRISPR into yourself? It's a bit early to do that. We don't know if it'll be safe or effective. So this is absolutely not happening as a treatment for sickle cell anemia, but the research on CRISPR is going at such a rate, and it has been done in vivo gene therapy for this other disease, TTR, which is quite different disease. Uh, I think one day it may well be possible to have uh, in vivo injections of CRISPR, which will correct, uh, put in one of these benign mutations in the, in the body, which may well be a treatment. So I think that's, that's something to look forward to for the future. Next slide, Sal. But this is the, the point that I started earlier. We also, because we know about these two brakes, uh, the two feet on the brake pedals, ZBTB7A and BC11A, my lab and others are trying to understand how these proteins work. Because if we could just find a small molecule that stopped these feet from landing on the brake pedals, that would be enough. And uh, ZBTB7A is perhaps not the best target because it's essential for blood cell growth and, and development. But BC11A doesn't seem to be essential for blood cell growth and development. So many people are looking for small molecules which might inhibit the operation of that protein. Next slide, please, Shao. And a friend of mine who also goes to the conferences with uh, Andrew Perkins, Stephen James, Jim Vidalis, Shao, and, uh, and myself is Gabe Global. And he did a screen to look for uh, kinases, a particular type of enzyme line that were involved in the production of BC11A and required for the production of BC11A. He found one called HRI and uh, he published this in Science and shows that uh, inhibitors of this kinase can uh, cause, uh, prevent BC11A production and can turn on fetal globin. Now, I don't know exactly where that's up to in terms of development, but it's just, uh, I think, a stunning example of how you can get um, uh, small molecule, you can find enzymes involved in the production of these, uh, the feet on the brake and stop them sitting on the brake and have the fetal globin gene coming on. Some of you might be, uh, this is my last slide. I, some of you might be saying, you know, you've talked about fetal globin. Why fetal globin? Why don't we just fix the sickle cell mutation with CRISPR gene editing? So there's two reasons for that. One is so far the CRISPR technology we've got can't actually quite fix that mutation, although people have made such strides in the last six months that we're getting pretty close to being able to say that could be done. But the other reason is that not everyone has the same mutation. Uh, there's the sickle cell mutation and there are other related mutations that cause beta thalassemia, which is a very similar uh, defect in uh, beta globin. And turning on the fetal globin gene will uh, be a treatment for pretty much all of these different beta hemoglobinopathies. So it's a general treatment. 
and could have just died, but I'm, I'm back. So the conclusion, sickle cell is one of the most famous, most prevalent, best studied diseases there are. Generations of researchers have been working towards cures uh, and um, we believe we'll have better and better treatments. CRISPR gene editing uh, is already being used uh, in trials, uh, but I think ultimately we will get drugs, uh, which will be the best way. And Australia has absolutely one of the best health systems in the world. Mark Butler mentioned one of the best multicultural communities. We've got some of the best scientists. We absolutely do not have the scientific scale, but we're connected to the scale of the world. And I think there's a great future of research and treatment in Australia. Okay, that's enough from me. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, just the acknowledgements. Yes, Gabby, everyone in the lab, Gabby Beaker, and Kate Quinlan, who works with me in, uh, in Sydney and everyone in the lab. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for that talk, Merlin. Um, if anyone has any questions, just throw them in the chat down there. In the meantime, I just wanted to, I wanted to ask you, well, what's like, what, what do you think is the most exciting or surprising discovery that came through like in during your career, your long history of studying the Globin field, was there any particular things that you just weren't yeah. expecting? Yeah, so I think for the long time, we felt that this was so complicated that there wouldn't be one single uh, secret, BC11A, to turning the Globin genes off. It will be many, many different things and also, we felt that perhaps it would be something that is so important that you couldn't disconnect it without uh, damaging the cell. It turns out BC11A isn't actually required for red blood cell growth and development. And that's crucially important. And I think it makes sense in hindsight that nature has used an unimportant protein to turn the fetal globin genes on and off so that it can turn them on and off without affecting other aspects of red cell biology. So we didn't know whether we'd ever find a perfect drug target, but it turns out BC11A possibly is one. It's a, it's a real bonus. So um, I saw another kind of historical question a commentary in Nature a few years ago saying that the cystic fibrosis gene has given more to molecular biology than molecular biology has ever given back to the cystic fibrosis patients. What are your thoughts on that with respect to these hemoglobinopathies? Because they are wonderful model genes and molecular biologists I, love them. I think that's a fair a very fair and interesting, insightful statement. I would say that I hope that the balance, I hope we can repay the debt in the future. And I, I'm pretty confident we will. I think this, this disease will be cured. Uh, and I think we're on the verge of curing it in countries like America, um, if their health system can, can manage to deliver it across their population. Uh, and I do think we'll get a, a, a worldwide cure, hopefully in my lifetime, but not if not in my children's lifetime. So I think it's true at the moment that, yeah, I mean, people also say there are some disease more people study them than have them. That's not the truth. That's not, not true of this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, you did talk quite a bit about the Globin Conference, and I... I that was like maybe the first conferences I went to as a student. And I have to say the Globin researchers are really for maybe the people on this, on this talk, that like the Globin researchers are really, really dedicated to the cause. And um, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so it's absolutely fascinating. The people who founded the field were some of the absolute leaders in molecular biology. Uh, very accomplished um, and sometimes proud people. And then we're into the next generation now mm -hmm. and we're a little bit, uh, uh, we're very cooperative, friendly, optimistic. 
we still feel like we're young because the older generation is older than us. Uh, but your generation <laughs> further down, Jao, which is great. You'll see great progress. And uh, it is a great community. And it's nice to be part of a community with a purpose. Uh, and there's a mixture of people like me who've come from a very scientific biochemistry and genetics background and others who come from a hematology and clinical background. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty good community and we look forward to getting together every two years, but we haven't been able to last year because of COVID. Okay, I think we're gonna call an end to this year, but cool. um, thank you so much for, for joining us today, Merlin, and I hope to see you soon. Yeah, I hope to see you soon. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and bye. Thank you.